might happen. Uh, I'm also the lucky coordinator of this project, so I'm also overlooking some of the other things. So um, I'm going to give you also some hints of what happened so far uh, before. Um, what we, when we are starting the future, I mean, we have been uh, seeing, uh, seeing this morning and we had a lot of things about the five-year plan. And uh, for us in this community, a five-year is a very short uh, uh, time span. So we think that uh, in this time that everything is changing very fast, changing in, on an uh, exponential uh, uh, way. Uh, technology has, has, has changing exponential and uh, these changes are causing uh, huge changes in the society, in the economy, on uh, how we live, how we work on the same quick level. So what we think is that uh, uh, we need to plan and we need to plan on long term. And uh, what we are doing and what we have been doing in the future on this part of uh, our project work is to see what might happen uh, with uh, an horizon uh, of 2030. So we are not trying to predict what is going to happen because we believe in Thomas also that nobody can predict uh, what is going to happen. But we can um, see or we can suggest some plausible scenarios. So this is our, our work here. We will try to uh, suggest some plausible scenarios and we will try to put these scenarios on the table and uh, assist you, uh, you the policy makers, to build a little more long-term strategy for the bilateral cooperation between Europe and China. So, uh, for a long time, uh, there was no development actually in the world. So you see that for many centuries, all the uh, development in the world was more or less stable. But uh, as I said before, the last years after the Industrial Revolution, technology is moving humanity faster and faster in developing in all the areas. And uh, it's amazing if you see how much time it took the UK to double its income and uh, it took like 60 years, uh, the previous centuries. But uh, China, uh, it took China only seven years to double its income, its GDP uh, income per capita. This is just one indicator, several indicators of how changes are fast and how you cannot relax and you can plan and you should be always on the edge preparing for tomorrow. Uh, what we have done before, and what we have done, we have concluded a couple of years ago, it was a previous study. At that study, we were only focusing on um, the research environment, and we would like to see a long-term picture of China in uh, 2025. So we focused on 16 trends and drivers that will transform the environment in China. And what we did is that we finally produced four scenarios four different scenarios that present four different images of China in 2025. Um, that was a more generic exercise. What we are doing now with Cairo's Future is we are trying to go a bit deeper, move a bit forward in 2030 and uh, dig a bit deeper and see and identify specific technology sectors or even specific technologies uh, that have a potential for collaboration between Europe and China. And when we are talking about collaboration potential, we are talking about technologies that Europe can offer to China, technologies that China can offer to Europe, but areas also that we need to collaborate together, do research together to address some challenges. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, my part, so what we did, and then Thomas is going to present the China work, uh, we have been working from the European side and we uh, try to identify what Westerners and Europeans are thinking about the perspective for collaborating with China. So we did a Delphi study with uh, 71 experts participating, participating in this. All the experts were in the area of research, of innovation, of technology, and actually half of them were also experienced uh, foresight experts. So, we had a very, uh, very specific selection of uh, who was participating in this study. Mainly from Europe, but also we had participants from the US, uh, you see also Azerbaijan and a few other countries, but mostly it was from Europe. So first, we asked them 
uh, to give us uh, their evaluation about the five megatrends that uh, you can find them everywhere in books, on the internet. These are the things that are really transforming uh, the global environment. So it's not only China that is affected, it's also Europe, but it's also every country. And uh, of course, they agree that they have a central uh, uh, position in transforming innovation environment in Europe, in China, everywhere. And we are talking about uh, uh, the need for resources and the resources that we have to find new ways to cover our needs. And uh, climate change, of course. The new technologies and especially the information revolution that is transforming our lives in every possible way. Globalization too, and with this we mean the transfer of power in different ways from the Western countries to the emerging countries. And we have the change in demographics, so, and we are not talking about uh, population growth, but we are, change, we are talking mostly about the quality, that we have quality that is characteristics like aging population and like <coughs> urbanization. So, um, the experts provide us some uh, specific uh, ideas on these uh, things and how these megatrends are affecting uh, technology and innovation. For example, they highlighted the need for energy dependence, the Internet of Things, Big Data, gamification of many traditional products and services that is going to happen and happen uh, in the future, mass customization, artificial intelligence and machine learning and biotech developments in different sectors. They have also indicated some interesting things like uh, what it seems to be an increasing fragility of the global financial system and the rising public debts worldwide that might cause some uh, need for different policies. New forms of public policies and governance uh, with new ways of citizen participation and uh, decision making. The rising immigration levels uh, due to climate change and due to economic issues, shifts in global economic and political power, value shifts on a personal level or in society level, like uh, sustainability, atomization, new work profiles, new work routines, new labor options, new roles and values in the world market. This is something that is going to happen more and more. And changes in IPR management technology transfer, Forget about the traditional models of IPR management. I'm sure and uh, the experts are sure that new models of how technology and IPR rights are managed are going to arise and be more popular in the future. So then uh, they evaluated a list of technological sectors, uh, a big list of technological sectors, and uh, we selected those sectors in order to match other similar studies. So we didn't think of these sectors by ourselves, but we follow other foresight studies that they have done similar work. So we have different sectors evaluated and we ask them to evaluate for in which sectors Europe is going to be strong in 2030. And for example, they evaluated uh, like uh, areas like energy storage, the Internet of Things, brain science, medical uh, materials, cancer diagnosis and treatment and some other areas that they believe Europe is going to be strong in 2030 going to be a strong uh, player in the global uh, playground. And then we have the weakest technological areas that doesn't mean that Europe is not going to be good, but it means that uh, maybe there are going to be other players that are going to be leading uh, this game and uh, these technologies like uh, nuclear energy or salt water agriculture or fish farming or nuclear fusion. So um, these are what the experts were thinking. And we had, but I will not present it here, some more uh, hints on specific technological areas uh, on these uh, things we have, we have seen. The other thing that we've been discussing and what uh, we ask the experts to evaluate, because technology is one thing, but what we experience today is also new business models, new markets, new ways of doing business. So we ask them to evaluate, uh, we selected 12, let's say, new business models or emerging business models or new markets and we ask them to evaluate them uh, of how important it are going to be in 2030. So we got an idea, for example, the rise of services and with the rise of services we mean like uh, things we can do by taking big data and uh, uh, having this information, manipulating this information and providing specific services 
or uh, for example um, uh, uh, 3D printing for the printing uh, customized uh, materials for, for the consumer. So that was supposed to be the most important uh, area that companies should focus and then we get the silver economy. So all the market, all the world, all the technologies focusing on the let's say the seniors, that is going to be an even more important uh, market group uh, in the future. And then we have the circular economy, all uh, things related to, with the environment and how we can be more sustainable. Uh, the third part of our study, and I uh, will close with this, was we asked them to see what are the perspectives for collaborating with China. And I just want to repeat, that was what the Europeans, the Westerns were thinking. So we focus only on this part. And uh, this is interesting also. Uh, first, we had a number of control, let's say, questions that we, it was the same questions that we were also delivered in the workshop that was made here in Shanghai to the Chinese audience. So that was interesting to see what the Europeans uh, replied in the same set of questions. So uh, we asked them a lot of stuff, just a very generic question, for example, uh, they believe that most probably 15 Chinese companies will be on the list of world's top 50 most innovative in 2030. China will be regarded as a necessary place to get presence for international corporations. The Chinese government uh, will not be as important as the private entrepreneurship and the in 2030 in, as a driving force for the Chinese, for the Chinese economy and uh, all major uh, multinational companies will have research centers in China and at least one university in China will be able to complete Oxford and Harvard by 2030. So that's what the experts believe. On the other side, uh, they don't believe that in, by 2030 China will be a dominant Nobel Prize nation. They don't believe that will be a leading export company in green tech and uh, they don't believe that China will have as many as pop stars as uh, the Western countries. And uh, if you're interested to see what the Shanghai workshop said, the questions and the replies were similar. So the Chinese more or less believe the same thing, except one, and this is related with the quality of the Chinese university. So the Chinese audience was not very sure that it's going to be a university in China in 2030 that would be able to compete with Harvard and Oxford. And uh, to conclude, we also asked them to judge specific technological areas uh, that they see perspectives for collaborating with China. So we had a lot of areas that uh, they had to evaluate and tell us uh, where they see perspectives for collaborating with China. And uh, just to uh, sum up, for example, you can see that with the blue line, the strong and very strong areas that they believe that are uh, very important for collaborating, like environmental management, smart energy systems of the future, uh, robotics, I see, I see agriculture and biotechnologies, telecommunication, and some other areas that they don't think that there is great potential for collaboration for different reasons, can be different reasons, reasons like nuclear fusion or safe nuclear engineering. So just summing up here with this, and uh, I will close with just uh, something that uh, I heard and I think it's nice. This is the Chinese word for risk and uh, I was told that this uh, entails two meanings. So it is composed by the Chinese uh, word for risk includes danger, which is obvious, and opportunity, and chance. So this is what we are trying to do now is with this risk environment to find, to be able to address the danger and find the opportunity. And I will give the floor to Thomas.